Um, as many of you know, I just returned back from India Thursday morning about 2 a.m. after being, thank you, thank you. What an incredible uh, trip that was, very eye-opening uh, to experience the, uh, the country there, um, the second largest uh, country in the world, and soon to surpass China to be the largest country, about 1.2 billion people. I think they were all within about three blocks of where we were. <laughs> people everywhere. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, obviously, a, a lot of poverty there. Uh, a number of people that live on $2 a day or less, many of them on $1 a day or less. And yet in the midst of all the lostness and darkness, uh, boy, there is an incredible light that is shining there. Um, every day we'd experience a different part of the ministry that uh, an Assemblies of God a missionary started many, many years ago. And uh, it is going strong. And I am so excited for us to partner together with what they're doing over there. Uh, in 2019, we'll be doing that. I'm going to share a lot about the story in uh, early January. I won't take a Sunday during uh, Christmas time now to do uh, a full story, but there'll be little stories come up here and there, but hopefully like the second Saturday of January uh, or the first Saturday, I'd like to share a little bit about that. But uh, just, just one quick little story. Uh, we had gone to a, uh, a school for the blind. There was a pastor there uh, that had taken in two blind children into his home well, eventually that began to grow and grow, where now they have just a number of them that are in uh, a school, in a home that they have there. Um, some very, very sad stories. I mean, obviously a number of kids that were born blind, but there was one young little girl who was not born blind, but she had some special needs. And so it was already determined if you have a special need in India, you'll probably end up as a beggar begging for money. And because that would be her situation, her parents decided that they were going to pour acid on her eyes in order to make her uh, be even more severe and to get more money as she was begging. Uh, just the sad stories, kids that were left in the garbage dump, uh, parents that just said, we don't want them because they're disabled. It was just amazing. Uh, and yet, here's this ministry that's reaching out and loving these kids. And you can't see that and, and not cry and weep. And you have to be so thankful for what God is doing there and touching these kids' lives, and just the stories go on and on. Uh, what an amazing ministry. Uh, even challenging for me to, to think, okay, what can we do here in our community to meet the needs of people that are hurting in a greater degree? So again, I wanna share with you more uh, as time will allow coming up in a few weeks, but uh, we wanna welcome you to our series uh, called The Greatest Story, and it is indeed the greatest story. As we're looking through the Bible, and looking at all these stories and Bible characters and how the entire Bible points to the message of God's love by sending his son Jesus Christ to come into our world, to die for us on the cross, to be resurrected again, and to include us in the mission of reaching the lost of the world. Uh, you are a part of that story. And we know that after Jesus rose again, he was on the road with a couple of travelers and he began to share with them how the Old Testament all pointed to himself. You are a part of the story. And uh, the story, as we know, begins with creation, it goes to the fall, the flood. Then we begin to track one family, the family of Abraham, his son Isaac and Jacob and into Joseph. Uh, and we, a few weeks ago, we talked about Joseph and how he was a, a, a powerful man. He was, he was brought into slavery there in, in Egypt. Uh, was raised up, uh, began to lead um, a lot of the things of Egypt. And they were in a severe drought, and God had placed him there to begin to allow them to begin to gather lots of things before the drought would come. And so placed him there. He went through a lot of difficult things to be placed in this position. And then uh, years later, we find the Israelites had grown in great numbers, and Pharaoh was fearing that they would overtake uh, Egypt, and so he declared that all the newborn children uh, were to be killed, all the baby boys. And there was a bo baby boy named Moses who was born, and his mother went and placed him in the Nile River, hoping he would survive. And Pharaoh's daughter came by and was about to bathe, and then saw that baby there and took that baby in. And the, we know the mom uh, nursed that baby for a while and then gave Moses back to Pharaoh's daughter. And then at the age of 40, Moses was upset because he saw his own people being mistreated by the Egyptians and he ended up killing an Egyptian and it got, word got out and he ended up fleeing and was gone for 40 years. Um, he married Jethro's daughter um, and then God met him 
in what we know as, as the burning bush story. Anybody ever had an encounter with God at a burning bush before? I haven't either. Wouldn't that be cool, though? It'd be like, wow, this would be awesome, especially in the middle of winter. <laughs> that would really feel good, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, God begins to respond to, the, respond to the cry of the Israelites in Egypt, and God calls Moses from this burning bush to go back to Egypt to lead the Israelites away from slavery. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit because it's interesting how God predicted these things, and so back in, we're in Exodus now, but back in Genesis 15, let's read what God said to Abraham and what would happen to his people in verse number 12. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So in making the promise to Abraham, God told him his descendants would be enslaved and oppressed in Egypt for 400 years. And we see that come to pass as we read about in the story in Exodus. Well, following the experience of slavery, they would then return to their homeland with great possessions. Now, there's a little puzzling uh, note at the end of the last verse I read. It says, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. According to the teacher's commentary, in, in making the promise to Abraham, uh, he, he he talked about the Amorites. And they were people who then lived in the land that God had promised to Abraham and to Israel. Well, archaeological research tells us a lot about them, particularly about their depravity. They were people whose moral and religious decline was marked by cult prostitution and even the sacrifice of their babies who were burned alive to their nature gods. For 400 years, God in grace held back his judgment and permitted his own people to suffer in Egypt while he was hoping that the Amorites would respond to God and would repent of what they were doing because of God's grace. That is his nature. His nature is to love. Well, they had reached a point of no return, and God used Israel to eventually judge the Amorites. Now, for centuries, Israel waited in Egypt while God was dealing with those people. For centuries, their suffering began to deepen even more and more. And only now, looking back, can we see some of the reasons. Even in their agony, God was at work to do them and to do others good. God is always at work to do good towards us. Now, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, we find part of the dialogue between Moses and God with the burning bush. And in verse 11 it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses hears this call. And you would think when it comes from a burning bush, there would be no hesitation whatsoever to take the call. But Moses hesitated. He had so many reasons why he could not do what God was calling him to do. And he says, well, what if they do not believe me? And then he says, Lord, I've never been eloquent. It seems to be apparent that Moses had a fear of speaking in front of others or a speech impediment or something, and so he was afraid to go and approach Pharaoh. And then finally Moses says, Lord, please send somebody else. Please send somebody else. You ever said that to God? <laughs> Lord, why are you picking me for this? <laughs> please use somebody else, please. Well, each of these objections indicates clearly that Moses now was all too aware of his inadequacy. He went from being an I can to an I can't person. 
Now it's important that we all know our limitations. We all face limitations. Um, but we can be too overwhelmed by what we think are our weaknesses. And those weaknesses that we perceive to be weaknesses, we can actually, when we see those things, we can actually say, I'm not fit for ministry. I can't do such and such that God's calling me to do. God, you're crazy. You don't know who you're speaking to. I can't do that. Many of you have felt that way. Perhaps all of us have felt that way a time or two. God has spoken to you about doing this or doing that, and you're like, nah, you got the wrong person. You've called the wrong number. Moses was feeling like that. God, I'm the wrong person. I can't do this. Has God ever asked you to do something for him, but you replied back to God with excuse after excuse why God had talked to the wrong person? Has fear ever stopped you from doing what God has asked you to do? If it has, you can certainly relate to Moses this morning. God wanted Moses to go to Pharaoh and to guide the Israelites out of Egypt. God wanted to free them from slavery and then begin the journey to take them to the promised land where they would be free and have the things that they needed. With faith and trust in the power of God, Moses got to the point where he then obeyed God. And God had Aaron come alongside Moses to help him. He gave them instructions on what to say, on what to do. And they both obeyed God and they arrived in Egypt. And Moses and Aaron they were then reunited with the elders of, of, of the people of Israel. They told them what God had said. Next, Moses and Aaron then went to speak to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And they asked him to let God's people go. Well, in front of the king, Moses had this staff. And he let down the staff. And it became a snake. I have a staff in my office. I almost brought it out thinking maybe God would do that again, huh? Wouldn't that be cool? And all the front row would just clear out, right? <laughs> I mean, Mike, Sheila would just pull you, push you right over and she'd be out the door. I know that. Well, if Pharaoh had some magicians and they let down their staff and theirs too became a snake, which that's pretty amazing. Now even more amazing is then snake went and gobbled up that snake. <laughs> The king hardened his heart. He wouldn't let the Israelites leave. And he became even more cruel to the slaves. Therefore, God began to send disaster after disaster, only because Pharaoh's heart was hard. So we have these plagues. Again, if you've seen the mo movie with Charlton Heston, you've seen these plagues. The first plague was transforming water to blood. Can you imagine all the water being blood? You go to turn on the faucet to get a drink, and blood comes out. You go to take a shower or bath and blood comes out. You go to wash your car and blood comes out of the hose, right? You're sprinkling your lawn and red blood is coming out everywhere. Everything is blood. All waters turn to blood. The second plague was that of frogs. Now, a couple frogs are kind of cute. I mean, that's all. Oh, look at that frog. But can you imagine having frogs everywhere, getting into everything? You go to bed at night, you pull back your covers and there's frogs everywhere. Third plague was that of gnats or lice. Ooh, you ever had lice hit your home before? We have. That's a disaster. Everything gets cleaned, everything gets taken out. It's just, it's a mess. Lice everywhere. The fourth plague was that of flies. And then the fifth plague was livestock that was dying. Imagine the smells of dead livestock everywhere. The seventh plague was that of hail. Now, we've all gone through hailstorms here and there. Nothing like what they experienced here. I mean, this is like major dodgeball, right? I mean, the hail is coming down, and it is hitting people. The next one was that of locusts, the eighth plague. And then the ninth plague, that of darkness. Darkness came on the land. And still, Pharaoh's heart remained hard. Moses had done what God had commanded, but Pharaoh wouldn't listen. And so now even the burden on the slaves increased. Pharaoh was like, you know what I'm gonna do? Instead of even letting you go, I'm gonna make it harder for you. See, these were slaves that were making bricks, and the Egyptians would at least supply the hay to make the bricks, but now 
the Israelites had to go and they even had to gather all of that stuff to make the bricks and they had to still make the same quantity as they did before. Well, the people of Israel began to turn on Moses. What do you do when the people you're trying to help turn on you? You ever been in that situation before? You're trying to help somebody, you're trying to do the best for them, and they turn on you? Man, well, I'm, what am I, wasting my time here? I'm doing this for you, right? Moses was experiencing that. In fact, he said, he turned to God, he said, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Is this why, so that everybody could turn on me? Friends, every ministry knows disappointments. No path that God asks us to follow will always be a smooth path. When you do something for God, you will almost always face some opposition. If you're not, probably something's not right. It will come. It's not like when God calls you, it means everything's going to be perfect. It means there's some challenges that you will face when God calls you to do something for him. So with sadness, God prepares a tenth plague. And God told Moses to tell each Israelite family that they were to kill a lamb without any defects. And they were to take the blood of that lamb and they were to put it on the tops and the sides of their, the door frame of their home. They were to roast the meat and eat it and being prepared to leave immediately. The Israelites obeyed God and at midnight, the Bible tells us that the Lord struck down the firstborn, the oldest child in each family, the livestock in Egypt. Imagine the wails, the mourning that's going on, the crying as, as one house after the other has somebody in that house that had died because of the plague that had come. God didn't want that, but God was trying to get his people out of there. And because of the hardness of Pharaoh, God kept one thing going after the other. But it's amazing how every single house that was covered by the blood of the lamb was protected. What a, what a foreshadowing, what a pointing to Jesus Christ. The, the communion that we're going to celebrate today. The blood of the lamb, the power that is in the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, to protect us from death, from sin, from eternal judgment. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And so that blood that they had shed and put on their door frames protected them. And King Pharaoh, he's crying and he's lamenting over the loss of his own son. And finally he gets desperate and he gives permission for the Israelites to leave. Exodus 12, 31 says, During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up! Leave my people, you and the Israelites, go. Worship the Lord you, as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds, as you have said, and go. And also bless me. So trusting God, Moses quickly gathers the people, gets the word out, and they begin to leave Egypt. And through God's power, the Israelites would no longer be cruelly treated as slaves by the Egyptians. God had finally set them free. After living in Egypt over 400 years, they were now on their way to the promised land. And look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. It says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Wouldn't that be cool? How many of you like to have that? This cloud and this, this fire guiding you along. We say, wow, how easy it'd be. Just wherever that goes, we know that's where we're supposed to go. I wish it could be like that today, right? It would be this obvious. We have something even better. We have the spirit of the living God living inside of us to guide us and direct us where we ought to go, what we ought to do. While they're on their journey, they're being guided now by God, and suddenly Pharaoh changes his mind. What in the world did I do? Our slaves are gone, our workers are gone. What's gonna happen to our country? And so he prepares the Egyptian army to begin to go and to capture the Israelites, either kill them or to hopefully bring them back. Exodus 14, 13. The Egyptians are nearing the Israelites and the Israelites start complaining again to Moses, murmuring and complaining, murmuring and complaining all the time, right? And verse 13, Moses answered the people, says, do not be afraid. 
Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Do not be afraid. Be still. Trust in God. So here they have the Red Sea on one side. They have the Egyptian army coming on the other. They are trapped. And they know they're about to die. And Moses says, just be still. Now, friends, that's going to preach. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. You'll see your deliverance. Be still. That's a good word. We could pause right there and just kind of chew on that for a while, and that'd be comforting and encouraging. And normally that's a great verse for all of our life, just to be still in the Lord. There's a time to do that. There's a time just to wait in God's presence as we're facing a crisis, as we're facing trouble. But this was not the time. Normally a pastor wouldn't say, hey, stop praying. But this was not the time to keep praying and to stay still. In fact, God approaches Moses in verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Again, normally it's great to cry out to the Lord, but God's saying, you know what? Enough crying out to me now. I've told you what to do. It's time for action. Faith without works is dead, right? We can't just pray and pray and pray. There's a time that God gives us the answer, and it's time to move in faith when he does that. And so in verse 19, I'm going to read a little lengthier portion of what takes place here. It says, Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. I love how God comes in uh, between us and the enemy for us. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all the Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. And during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of the chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day... The Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Friends, there are so many, again, incredible lessons that we learn from this story. First of all, it was only after the last plague that Pharaoh and the Egyptians let them leave. They fought against God's will. And that fight against God's will cost them greatly. And they fought against God's will and they couldn't win against his will. I want to encourage you today, don't fight against God's will. You will not win. And God is for you, not against you. God has a plan for your life. And even though we can't always understand what God is up to because we don't see the big picture. When you know what God's will is, don't fight his will. Submit to his will because he has your best interest in mind. He's created you for a purpose and a plan. And when he reveals his plan to you, trust him. Trust him and follow. Secondly, Moses and Israelites trusted God to help them have the victory. Obeying and trusting God, they left Egypt for the promised land. Trust God. Obey God. Ask God to help you when you're facing problems, and he will be there for you 
And finally, I want us to point now this morning into, into the, the blood that they put over their door frames. There's power in that blood. It saved the life of their firstborn. The death angel passed over. That's where we get the word Passover. As Jesus was nearing his death, they celebrated the Passover, a time to remember what God had done for the Israelites in the land of Egypt, where he had rescued them. He had saved them from the death angel because of the blood. Friends, if you're here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus, you've never accepted what God has done for you through the giving of his own son, today's a great day to do that. Jesus came, and the Bible says he became the sacrifice once and for all. When I was in India, they had taken us to the the temple of Kali, which is one of their many gods. And she is the, the goddess of death and destruction. Their city is named after this goddess. I would have picked a different one myself. (laughs) <laughs> death and destruction. And because of that, as we went to this temple they had, we didn't go in there, but we went outside it. So sad to see a, a line of people waiting to go into the temple to bring some kind of an offering to this God so that this goddess wouldn't bring death and destruction upon them. And outside the temple, we saw a couple of gentlemen in a crowd gathered as they were actually sacrificing two goats and they were gonna bring this goat into the temple. You see, even in their hearts, they have this understanding of a blood sacrifice to appease this God of death and destruction. And hopefully if they would do that, then she would be nice to them. But to see that it's all for naught was so sad. There's only one sacrifice that can take away the sins of the world. And when Jesus came, he became that sacrifice, willingly laying down his life. As we approach this time of Christmas, it's so hard to, you know, Christmas and Easter are so joined together because he, he came and he came so that he could die for us. And there is power in the blood, and it sounds kind of gross, maybe with blood, that's kind of icky and gory and whatever, but you see, it's the blood that represents the sacrifice, a sacrifice of love. He willingly laid down his life for us. But friends, recognize the power that is in the blood of Jesus. Power for life, for healing, for overcoming demonic oppression and possession. There is power in the blood of Jesus. I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Before we do that, I want to focus in on a couple things. First of all, number one is, again, if you're here today and you have never accepted the wonderful gift of Jesus Christ himself, who willingly laid down his life for you. The Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't wait for you to clean up your life and then say, okay, it's good enough, I'll die for you. He died for us even in our sin. No sin is too great that God's blood cannot cover. No one is too far that God's love will not accept them. So if you're here today and maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus, you can try to be good and maybe coming to church is one of the things that, well, maybe if I just go to church, I'll be good enough, I'll make it to heaven. The Bible says no one is righteous, not even one. It's only through Jesus and accepting what he's done. If you're here today and you just feel the tug of the Holy Spirit inviting you to give your heart to Jesus, Right now, would you just raise up your hand real high this morning? I just want to lead in a prayer of faith uh, for you, if, if that's you this morning. 
Again, if that's you, just raise up your hand real high. Yes, thank you. I see that hand in the front of the child. Anyone else? Anyone else here this morning? Hey, today's a great day to give your heart to Jesus, to accept what he's done for you. Just going to wait a moment longer. The Bible says if we have faith of a child, right? The faith of a child. There's a child that raised their hand this morning. I'd like all of us, if we could, pray this prayer together with me. If you didn't raise your hand, I still want to encourage you to pray this prayer together. Yes, I see that hand as well. Anyone else? That's you. Let's just pray this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me and sending your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me. I do confess that I have sinned. But I now invite you to come into my heart. Be my Savior and my Lord. And help me to live my life in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we want to give you a book at the end of the service. Please meet me up here at the end. I love just busy with you real quickly. And again, give you a little booklet that's going to help you grow in your faith. Before we move into communion, I understand that there may be some of you here today that because of the way you feel about your own life, maybe because of the things of the past, mistakes that you've made, when God has called you or invited you to come and walk with him, or God has invited you to come and be a part of a ministry or to do something for him, you have taken yourself out of the equation because you yourself do not feel like you're worthy of it. You do not feel like you're capable of it at all. And of course, you yourself are not. But when God calls you, he equips you. God's not looking for someone that's filled with talent and ability. We see that over and over again in Scripture. Very few times does he call somebody that's got it all together. But often he calls somebody that's got pain in their life or problems or some kind of what we would think of as a disability. And God moves in their behalf and God uses them. Some of you have discounted yourself for ministry. And you've said, oh, pastor, if you knew about my past, God knows about your past. And he loves you and he calls you, and he has a purpose for your life. So don't take yourself out of what God has called you to do. Some of you just need to hear that today. Some of you have just taken yourself out of the picture saying, God, you, how can you ever use me? He wants to use you, and he has a plan for your life. So it's time to get going, amen? It's time to be obedient to what God's called you to do, to trust him and be a part of his mission to save the world for, for his glory and his honor.
Hallelujah. Would you take a moment and lift your voice and worship to him today? Just thank him for his love and his mercy, for saving us from our sin. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you, God. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. We serve such a loving and gracious God who's always good to us. Hallelujah. Before we go, let me pray for you and God's blessing upon you today. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for allowing us to be in the presence of the Almighty God. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just take one thing throughout the service that you've spoken to us, that we can apply to our life, that we can live out, that we can focus in on. And God, as we leave this building, you're calling us into a community, into our neighborhoods to be able to go and share the story of what you've done in our life. God, open our mouths and you will fill it. Give us a heart for the hurting. We don't go out there to condemn. We go out there to love and to share the love of God wherever we go. Lord, help us. Guide us, I pray. May we be a blessing just as you have blessed us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great Lord's Day today. Thank you for coming today.